Good afternoon, everyone. In Bonn today, for the high-level segment of the 23rd Conference of Parties, or COP23, the Secretary General said that we need more ambition in the fight against climate change, the defining threat of our time. He identified five ambition action areas. First, reducing emissions as 2017 will see the first increase in CO2 emissions in three years, and the window of opportunity to meet the two degree target may close in 20 years or less. Second, adaptation and strengthening resilience. The, strength, the Secretary General stressed the catalytic role that the Green Climate Fund can play on this, as well as the role of the insurance industry. A third action area is finance, as the Secretary General recalled that we need to mobilize the agreed $100 billion annually for developing countries. Upholding this promise is essential for building confidence and trust, he said. And he added that to meet the Paris goals, we need at least 50% global coverage and a higher price on carbon to drive large-scale climate action. The fourth ambition action area is partnerships, the Secretary General stressed. He said that partnerships with the private sector, local and regional governments, and civil society will make or break efforts to implement the Paris Agreements. Fifth, we need heights of political leadership. The Secretary General said he could think of no greater way for leaders to show people that they care for the well-being of their citizens than to claim the mantle of climate leadership, and he asked them to show courage, wisdom, and compassion. In Bonn, the Secretary General also held a series of bilateral meetings, including with President Emmanuel Macron of France and China's Special Representative on Climate Change Affairs, Xi Jinping. Tomorrow, the Secretary General will be in London to give a lecture at the School of Oriental and African Studies of the University of London on counterterrorism and human rights, winning the fight while upholding our values. In Vancouver, the Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, Jean Pierre Lacroix, just addressed the UN Peacekeeping Defense Ministerial. He said that UN peacekeeping is one of the most effective tools available to the international community to respond collectively to challenges of global peace and security. Since the deployment of the first mission in 1948, he said conflicts, and therefore peacekeeping itself, have evolved, and he stressed that we should not be limited by the stricture of past practice. 21st century peacekeeping must have an agile and targeted presence, a tighter command structure, and more mobility. Peacekeepers must be prepared to implement mandates safely and effectively, with the right capabilities for high threat environments, such as terrorist threats and transnational organized crime, he added. He also noted that women peacekeepers, troops, and police are central to our strategy to protect civilians and engage with communities. While we have made progress on reaching our goals for women peacekeepers, he said that most member states have not met the modest target of 15% female staff officers and military observers. He also reiterated the need to ensure that we uphold the trust of the population in particular by enforcing the Secretary General's zero tolerance policy for sexual exploitation and abuse. This morning, the Security Council renewed the mandate of the UN mission in the Central African Republic for 12 months and authorized an increase of 900 troops in its troop ceiling, as recommended by the Secretary General. MINUSCA's new mandate will focus on three priority tasks, the protection of civilians, enhanced support to the peace process, including national reconciliation, social cohesion and transitional justice, and facilitating the creation of a secure environment for the immediate, full, safe, and unhindered delivery of humanitarian assistance. The Assistant Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, Bintu Keta, then briefed the Council on Darfur. She said that the political process to negotiate the settlement of the conflict with the non-signatories of the Doha document for peace in Darfur remains stalled. At the same time, she noted that armed clashes between the government and these non-signatories have subsided. Ms. Keita said it is evident that Darfur today is different from the time of UNAMIT's initial deployment, given the overall improvement in terms of security. However, positive developments have not resulted in the voluntary and sustainable return of internally displaced people, and nearly one-third of the population in Darfur remains displaced. Ms. Keita added that this reflects anxiety about security and uncertainty about the occupation of their land, as well as the lack of confidence about their present and future prospects. Key to this dilemma, she said, is slow progress in addressing critical issues such as land and other scarce resource management, accountability, and security sector reform. The High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid Radul Hussein, today called on the authorities in the Democratic Republic of the Congo 
to halt the inflammatory rhetoric against protesters and to ensure that demonstrations across the country today are handled in line with international human rights law and standards. Among, upon publication of the electoral calendar on the 5th of November, civil society organizations called for nationwide protests to be held today. The Human Rights Office said that in response, a number of alarming comments were reportedly made by provincial police inspectors in Goma and Kinshasa. The High Commissioner calls for, called for political leaders at the highest levels to ensure respect for the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and association and the freedom of expression. He also called on all sides to exercise restraint and to renounce the use of violence. And the UN mission, MONUSCO, has urged the authorities to respect freedom of assembly and of demonstration. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that as of the 12th of November, there are over 925,000 suspected cholera cases in Yemen, with more than 2,200 associated deaths. Aid workers continue to respond to the outbreak, but warn that fuel to run hospital generators and to pump clean water will run out in less than three weeks. Vaccines needed to treat diphtheria will also run out in two weeks. Ships and planes carrying humanitarian supplies have been unable to reach Yemen since the start of the blockade. We continue to be concerned for the protection and well-being of civilians in eastern Ghouta, in Syria, as civilians continue to bear the brunt of continued fighting in the past days. A market in Duma was reportedly hit by an airstrike today, with additional airstrikes and shelling reported in multiple towns in eastern Ghouta, resulting in civilian casualties. At the same time, indiscriminate shelling on different residential areas in Damascus was also reported. Yesterday, a UN Syrian Arab Red Crescent International Committee of the Red Cross Interagency Convoy delivered food, water and sanitation, health, education and other relief items for 107,500 people in need in the hard to reach area of Ar Rastan in Homs Governorate. Solar lamps and some health items were rejected or not approved to be loaded. The last UN interagency convoy to the hard to reach area was on the 27th of August, 2017. Our colleagues at the UN Office on Drugs and Crime tell us that opium production in Afghanistan has jumped to a record level this year, up by 87% compared to 2016. According to the agency's latest survey, the area under opium poppy cultivation also increased to a record 328,000 hectares in 2017, up by 63%, compared with 201,000 hectares in 2016. UNODC said the increase in production is mainly a result of an increase in the area under po opium poppy cultivation, while an increase in opium yield per hectare also contributed. The agency also noted that a lack of quality education, scarce employment opportunities, and limited access to financial markets and services are turning people to opium cultivation, and called on the government and the international community to reprioritize drug control in the country. More information is available on the UNODC website. And in the lead up to the 63rd World Children's Day, our colleagues at the Visitor Services have inaugurated this morning a UN Kids Corridor, where tours for five to 10 year olds will be conducted. Alison Smale, Under Secretary General for Global Communications, gave welcoming remarks surrounded by children from the Montessori Family School of Manhattan, who in turn sang a song of peace. The space located in the West Corridor of the General Assembly Building mirrors the different stops of the regular tour route in a child friendly way. Wall-sized world maps, mounted flags of the Security Council's 15 members, a child-friendly version of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and a real-sized refugee tent are part of the new tour area. You're all more than welcome to visit the new space and bring your children on a tour offered every afternoon. Please contact Vincenzo Pugliesi, Chief of Guided Tours, for further information. And that is for me. After I'm done, you'll hear the dulcet tones of my colleague, Brendan Varma, the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly. But first, are there any questions for me? If not, oh, OK. One or two. I have two, two things. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm keeping ask, asking this because I don't feel that it's been answered. So I want to ask you, maybe with a different, uh, Maybe you'll get an answer to this one. The answer is as follows. It has to do with I mean, the, 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 so, the so-called Rosewood Racket and the report that was put out by the Environmental Investigation Agency. And it's a very detailed report. And, one, and I've read what was put out by the Secretary General. I've read what her interview with the, 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 the Pulse, the cable. And what I wanted to ask you is, when she signed these 4,000 certificates, CITES regulations require that they be filed with the Secretary of CITES if they are, in fact, retroactive. 
And so it's not answered anywhere. And I'd like you to either maybe get an answer from her or have her have a press conference when she comes back. If that was committed to, that would seem to be the way to go. Were these certificates ever filed with CITES, given the various pronouncements that is made by this, this uh, secretariat about commitment to these regulations? Well, I believe uh, Stefan has already given you the details of where we stand on this. I don't have anything further to add on this. If the uh, Convention on International Trade and Endangered Spe Species, CITES, uh, has any actions, uh, we can evaluate it at, th at, that, at that time. But at this stage, uh, we've said what we've said uh, in terms of her actions. But I guess my, my question is, he said, he's, I mean, I'm asking a question. He said your question is answered by the statement by the Secretary General, but it's not answered. It's a straight factual question. Were the, she signed the certificates. Were they, in fact, filed with the CITE Secretariat as required? It's just a yes she, or no. Uh, she, uh, uh, the Deputy Secretary General has made clear that she followed the procedures that were supposed to be followed so, uh, in, in what she was doing. I have one other, because, and the reason I'm asking you this is because the, the resident representative of the UN in Kenya, Siddharth Chatterjee, has today issued a, an interview saying that the whole report is fake news and she's a great person. She may be a great person, but what I wanted to know is, is he speaking on behalf of Amina Mohammed or the UN system when he says this detailed report of, of seeming violations of CITES regulations is fake news? Uh, I don't have to uh, comment for him. He's, he's offering his personal view. This is, that's outside of his particular area. Yes. Thank you. Uh, in, on Zimbabwe, the situation, the political situation is kind of confusing, actually. Do you have a clear idea about what's going on, who is ruling the country, actually? Uh, you're right that uh, the developments are uh, a little bit confusing right now, and we're trying to get the details on this. Uh, the Secretary General has been monitoring the evolving situation in Zimbabwe. He appeals for calm, nonviolence, and restraint. Preservation of fundamental rights, including freedom of speech and assembly, is of vital importance. The Secretary General stresses the importance of resolving political differences through peaceful means and dialogue and in line with the country's constitution. In this context, he notes the efforts of the Southern African development community. Yes. Thank you, Farhan. I have two questions, both on Africa and actually the first one is follow-up on Zimbabwe. There were some reports that after, after <clears throat> replacement of Robert Mugabe, his wife, Grace Mugabe, can possibly be a candidate to lead the country. Does UN have any information on that? And also, the chief of opposition, Tande Bidi, called for a dialogue with African Union, with United Nations and other international leaders uh, in uh, the region. Is UN going to engage in such kind of dialogue? And if yes, when and how? Well, I don't want to speculate uh, what will happen in the future. At this stage, uh, there's a bit of confusion on the ground. We are aware that our colleagues in Harare have been able to go about their work, and we're continuing to go about our work and monitor the situation. Uh, at the same time, uh, as I just pointed out, what we do want uh, is for uh, all political differences to be resolved through peaceful means and dialogue. And of course, we do note the role of the main regional group, the Southern African Development Community, in that uh, context. Of course, I wasn't talking about speculations. Is there a roadmap in the place or not yet for, for UN? Uh, we can see what role we have uh, as, as matters progress. At this stage, like I said, we're monitoring the situation. We're, we're in touch uh, with uh, parties through our office on the ground, and we'll see where we go from there. And my second question yes. is on Niger. <laughs> Several months ago, there was uh, this horrible altercation between terrorists and American troops and government troops, and four American soldiers were murdered, and four government soldiers were murdered near village Tonga Tonga. And there was an inv investigation underway. Is UN partaking somehow in this investigation? Do you have any further information? Is anything being done to stabilize the situation in general? Uh, I believe that the investigation you're referring to is being conducted by the United States, and, and uh, it's not uh, one for the United Nations to play a part in. Uh, yes. Thank you, Farhan. I want to uh, ask about uh, um, Iraq. Today, uh, Mr. Kovish had a meeting with the Prime Minister of Kurdistan region of Iraq, and after the meeting, the Prime Minister's office issued a statement that uh, Mr. Kubish handed the Prime Minister a letter from Secretary General that encouraged the dialogue between Baghdad and Erbil. Can you tell me more about that uh, letter um, from the Secretary General to uh, Kurdistan region of Iraq? Uh, no, I don't, I don't have any uh, details. If, if there's anything to share about uh, our diplomatic correspondences, I'll let you know. Uh, of course, you're aware 
of the role uh, that uh, Mr. Kubish and the UN mission in Iraq have played, trying to uh, make sure that, uh, that uh, any differences between Baghdad and Erbil can be resolved constructively. Uh, and this is part and parcel of that effort. But if, if there's any further details to share, I'll, I'll let you know at that point. Also about Iraq, it's been more than a week I asked for a, uh, a new humanitarian update from Iraq. And uh, I mean, uh, during the Mosul operation, we used to have at least two or three uh, updates, uh, humanitarian update about the situation in Iraq. But recently, um, I don't understand why the humanitarian office and OCHA don't release any reports about what's going on there. Uh, especially uh, with the refugee crisis still going, and the, the crisis is the same, but we are getting less and less information. Well, for today, what I can tell you on our humanitarian side is uh, that one of our aid partners secured access uh, to the newly retaken Rumana area, northwest of Qaim district in western Anbar. Rapid response emergency packages have been distributed to over 1,000 people. Since military operations in Western Anbar resumed in late October, partners have reached over 9,800 people with rapid response and emergency health services in newly retaken areas of Western Anbar. Uh, so far this year, more than 67,000 people have been displaced from Western Anbar, 16,000 of whom have been displaced in the context of the resumption of counter Daesh military operations in the region last month. That's Anbar, and the, the situation in Kirkuk and the other... I, I don't have a Kirkuk update for you today. Uh, yeah. Benny. A couple of questions. Uh, first of all, just a technical one. If the Security Council doesn't manage to renew tomorrow night the mandate of the gym, is, does that mean effectively that the gym is over? Obviously, anything for which we require a mandate needs the renewal of that mandate. If you don't get the renewal of the mandate, then it expires. Uh, that's, that's where we stand on, on any such case. Let's see what, uh, what the coming day brings. So, this is, so the, the, the secretari secretari or secretariat part of the gym is dissolved in that case? We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But obviously, if you don't have a mandate for operations, the operations end. OK, second question is about. Uh, report from Yon Hap, the, the South Korean news agency, about uh, a, a ship that was uh, ships that were caught with uh, North Korean arms to Somalia, uh, Iranian ships. There's too many violations of Security Council here to count, Security Council resolutions to count. But uh, does the UN have any information on any of that? Well, this, all the relevant information needs to go to the sanctions committee that deals with this. Actually, there, there's potentially a couple of sanctions committees, but at least the DPRK uh, sanctions committee would need to, uh, to be informed and, and, to, and, and to, and to uh, react. Uh, yes, yes, please, the back. Yes. And then you. Thank you, Mr. Huck. Uh, uh, about Rohingya crisis, uh, first question is simple. Uh, did Secretary General had a chance to talk with uh, uh, Ms. Aung San Suu Kyi in Philippines in, during the ASEAN summit? Uh, yes, yes, and we put out a readout of that meeting. Okay, and uh, second question is uh, about uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Mr. Uh, Zaid, speech uh, yesterday at Columbia University, and he said that uh, about ASEAN summit, I'm very uh, unhappy given what I have seen in the summit. Uh, many uh, world leaders have uh, avoided even using the term Rohingya uh, after what they have suffered. It's very, very disappointing. And also about uh, Ms. Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, I'm hugely disappointed. So uh, Secretary General, uh, the, those views expressed are those of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and, and he's certainly entitled to them. The Secretary General, uh, as I pointed out, met with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, just two days ago, and he's continuing his work all on this issue, uh, and you are aware of what his priorities are. Yes, Linda. Excuse me. Thank you, Farhan. Going back to Afghanistan, 
You mentioned that the UNODC has obviously reported a large increase in the production of opium. I was just wondering um, what the actual presence of the UN is in that area and the principal role it plays. Well, the, the UN, the part of the point beyond reporting on opium cultivation is that the UN tries to make sure that there are encouragement for alternative practices so s that people can shift away from the economy of harvesting opium. And uh, so UN ODC is involved, but also, uh, of course, we have our mission on the ground, UNAMA, uh, that, uh, that is trying to help uh, uh, wean people away uh, from uh, that uh, extremely dangerous lifestyle. Do they run schools or any other, or various provide jobs and uh, that kind of thing? There are uh, entities, including the UN Development Program, that try to help with uh, job creation initiatives, yes. Yeah. I have a follow-up question on my colleagues uh, uh, mentioning of Rohingya people. Uh, US uh, Holocaust Museum officially stated that there is enough evidence to consider genocide that's being committed against Rohingya people in Burma. What is UN's official take on this? Uh, how does UN qualify? What's happening to Rohingya people in Burma right now? We, we've already talked about the brutalities of it. Uh, regarding the charges of genocide, uh, as you know, uh, that would need to be determined you know, by a, a, a properly competent court uh, for, for that uh, to be established. Uh, but uh, but uh, as you know, uh, the Secretary General, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and many others have spoken out very clearly against uh, the sort of uh, brutal treatment uh, that has been uh, that has been uh, uh, afflicted upon uh, the Rohingya population, and we're trying to do what we can to make sure that they can return uh, peacefully to their home. Yeah, a little clarification. So, what's the official term that UN would use at this point? Because the terms are very important in these kinds of issues of human rights. It's atrocities, brutal treatment. What is it? We we, ha we have talked about atrocities. Uh, in, indeed, if if you Remember, just a few weeks ago, the High Commissioner for Human Rights called this a textbook case of ethnic cleansing. Yes. Uh, Farhan, um, uh, in Iran there was an earthquake, and also on Iran Iraq border, and uh, especially on the Iran side, uh, the, there are reportedly more than 500 deaths and hundreds of uh, victims. It's, it's a catastrophe. Um, I wanted to ask what is the UN's role in this, uh, in helping the victims and the affected areas? Uh, is the government allowing um, international aid to go in? Uh, yes. Uh, re regarding our actions uh, in Iraq, we've been working with the government of Iraq and we are trying uh, Iran, to, uh, yeah. Uh, Iran is, is uh, slightly um, different and we're, we're looking to see what role we can play to help there. Uh, with, with Iraq, we've been uh, providing uh, help with, uh, uh, including with uh, assessment of the damages that have been done. And so we're, but uh, as, as you saw from the statement we issued on Sunday, we're willing to play a role uh, with, uh, with both of the countries, trying to uh, help them recover from uh, the effects of this, uh, of this tragic uh, earthquake. I just want to understand about uh, the, the Iran the affected area, which is all Kurdish areas, and uh, uh, reportedly foreign journalists are not allowed to go in to report on the damages. I just want to understand, is UN allowed to, to send aid or send personnel there so far? And do you have any information about uh, the victims, what's going on over there, since there's no media well, reports? At this, at this point, what we're doing is uh, working through our... Um, you know, through our office in Tehran to get more information. Uh, we've we've uh, uh, offered our help as needed, and if we get a particular request uh, for assistance, we would be uh, willing to, to provide that. Yes. Sure, I want to ask you about, in, in, in Togo, uh, there have been these protests, people have been killed, and now, now the opposition yesterday held a press conference and said that the, 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 the president has called the protesters terrorists, and is, as has, uh, said that the army can easily put this down. So they've said this is kind of a declaration of war on them, and I just, it made me wonder. I know that Mr. Chambas was, had gone there, was working on this issue. In terms of conflict prevention, what does he think about the president's comments uh, that protesters in the street are terrorists, and what's the UN, uh, I guess, doing on this issue? 
Well, uh, regarding that, we, re we reiterate our calls to Togolese stakeholders to engage in dialogue in order to arrive at a speedy, consensual, and negotiated resolution of the ongoing crisis, to refrain from violence, and to ensure respect for human rights and the rule of law. And we do stand ready to support the Togolese in finding a peaceful solution to the crisis. And as you know, Mr. Chambas uh, uh, is involved in that effort. Okay. And also, just on, since it's, I guess since the Secretary General is going to give this speech on, on countering terrorism while it's in, you know, holding up values, uh, tonight, uh, Cameroonian journalist uh, Ahmed Abba is going to get an award, the International Press Freedom Award, not in person because he's been sentenced to 10 years in jail for reporting on the conflict in Cameroon, and he's been c convicted under anti-terrorism laws. So it made me wonder, when the Secretary General visited and met with uh, the President of Cameroon, Paul Bia, who's largely responsible for this prosecution and imprisonment of a journalist, was this issue raised? And, and, and does it fall within the ambit of, of the Secretary General's views of proper use or improper use of terrorism laws, uh, uh, in this case, to, to imprison a journalist? Uh, the Secretary General has made it clear that any measures uh, that are counter-terrorist measures should not be used to restrict uh, the enjoyment of human rights in, in any aspect, including freedom of expression and freedom of the media. And that would be the case uh, here as well. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, just a f follow uh, follow up on the Rohingya uh, problem, Rohingya massacre. I mean, if you can enlighten us a little bit, uh, how does the UN works when it comes to prosecuting this kind of uh, ethnic cleansing, as it as it has been called? Does does the Security Council does it have to create an ad hoc tribunal like it did in uh, for the former Yugoslavia and uh, uh, and Rwanda, or the ICC, the ICC prosecutor, could just uh, get involved in the case? Uh, the questions about the International Criminal Court really need to go to them. They, they operate independently of us. But by and large, uh, any tribunal would need to be created with a mandate, whatever the, the topic of it is. Uh, at this stage, when we're talking about accountability, it would need to be pursued by, by the authorities on the ground. Uh, if anything further needs to be created, it would need to be established one way or another. Uh, yes. Yeah, there's a story presented yesterday on CNN showing how migrants, mostly West African, have been sold in a detention camp in Libya uh, for roughly $400. Are you aware of it? And is that normal to still have a slave, slave market today, 21st it, it, century? Uh, it, it is not in the least bit normal. Yes, we, we saw this, and, it, and it's horrifying, the information. I believe uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights has also reacted ag against this. Uh, we have to put a stop to all of these sorts of practices, and it emphasizes once more the need to make sure that all migrants are, are treated with full respect so that they don't face this sort of uh, horrifying practice. Yeah. Just to, on, on, I guess it's Myanmar related. It was said uh, when on... One, if there's any update on getting a, a, a uh, formalized resident coordinator, and also it was said that Ms. Locke Desilin, around whom there was some controversy in terms of dealing with the Rohingya issue, it was said that she's come back to headquarters to assume another role. And so I've asked, I asked once before, but I just want to know, what is that role? Is it going to be as a resident coordinator in another country? Is it for DPA? What is the role? Well, we don't have anything to announce at, at present. Uh, w when we do, we will. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so just a follow up on the Zimbabwe uh, situation. Um, since uh, he first his first remarks to the Security Council, um, the Secretary General has emphasized the the need for prevention and you know preventing crises rather than just responding to them. And so I was wondering, will he uh, note bring this to the this situation to the attention of the Security Council in accordance with his role, uh, you know, outlined in the UN Charter, so that they can see so that they can have a meeting that, to discuss a, a way to if the reports are true, that they might be able to mitigate or prevent a further deterioration of the situation? I think it's too early to tell what steps need to be taken. Let's see what happens with the situation on the ground. You, you've heard what we've had to say on that.